celebrating the uh, recent publication of Gunash Marat Teshkor's new book, Liminal Minorities. I'm Peter Bergen. Uh, I'm the Vice President of Global Studies and Fellows at New America. I'm also a Professor of Practice in the School of Politics and Global Studies at Arizona State. Uh, Gunesh is uh, the Director of the School of Politics and Global Studies at, at Arizona State University. He's also the author of Muslim Reformers in Iran and Turkey and the editor of the Oxford Handbook of Turkish Politics. And he is going to talk about some of the big themes and stories in his new book, Liminal, Minor Liminal Mi Minorities. And then he will, uh, I will engage him in question and answer session. And then uh, the audience, please put your questions into Slido. I'll be monitoring those and I'll be feeding them to uh, Dr. Tejkor as they come up. So please uh, go right ahead and tell us uh, about your book. Congratulations on it. Yeah, thanks much, Peter. Thanks much for hosting me and it's great to have you as my colleague. Um, so I'm going to talk for 20 minutes and I will first start what this book tries to achieve in terms of addressing three big questions. Um, so the first question is basically the role of religion in inciting mass violence. Um, so, and this is kind of really a big both scholarly and public debate. So if I can say on the one end of the spectrum, you can think people like Richard Dawkins, Gut Delusion, this book, which was published back in 2006. And it always makes very provocative arguments. But one argument he makes is that religion has a specific function in really bringing more violence to human affairs. On the other hand, you have a more maybe also like a very venerable tradition. I will say that, I mean, you can find different people there too, but more like a Marxist tradition, which typically claims that whenever you see religion in politics, you have to basically look beyond that, beyond that because it's more like a fig leaf in the sense that people use religion as an instrument to promote their political interests and um, economic gains. So it's kind of really a, this big debate, which kind of animate lots of different thinkers and scholars over the, I would say, decades. So my own modest contribution is more about really trying to figure out under what conditions religious faiths, religious belief can play a role, kind of a unique role in uh, motivating certain individuals to attack uh, other individuals. So this is basically what I try to achieve, basically try to say that, yes, there can be certain circumstances under which we need to take religion seriously because it is a force by itself. And then unless you basically look at the religious belief, you can't really make sense of why some people engage in violence against some others. So this is basically what I try to do, uh, addressing this one big question. The second big question I deal with is the uh, why people engage in mass violence. And uh, I mean, there's obviously a huge literature on the Holocaust and I really benefit from reading lots of different work, works on the Holocaust. And again, um, on the one hand, you can think people like Goldhagen, Daniel Goldhagen, uh, the Villain Executions of Hitler, this book from the 1990s, and which became also very controversial. But his main argument is that antisemitism is one of the main reasons why the German society uh, became the tormentors of the Jews during the Nazi era. But then many other people disagree with that. And I think about some of the like Browning's, uh, this famous book, The Ordinary uh, Man, but then think about people like Milgram, Hannah Arendt, Zimbardo. So their position is that it's not that we have certain beliefs and then we attack other people, I mean, anybody can be a monster if you find that person under certain circumstances. This is basically more saying that if you put a very good person in wrong circumstances, you can basically find, uh, you, you can expect that that person is going to engage in also lots of violence. So it's kind of really two different ends of the spectrum. Uh, the predispositional, there are like certain beliefs which basically make people hate each other and then basically attack each other, or you don't need any hatred coming from the belief. It's just basically wrong circumstances and then anybody can be a monster under those circumstances. So my my contribution is I kind of try to make the argument that it's actually a combination of the both in a sense that you can't really understand violence unless you basically think about the extraordinary circumstances under, under which people find themselves. But at the same time, unless you basically look at people's fates, you can't really understand why they attack certain individuals, but not the others. So this is the second question I am engaging in this book. The third question is basically more about the Middle East, about the Muslim societies. Uh, I mean, obviously we are living through a uh, era of maybe uh, lots of violence, especially in the Israel-Palestine conflict. But then Middle East has been really in turmoil. We can make the argument at least since 2011, since the Arab uprisings. Um, so my argument is that, I mean, and then people ask why certain minorities are being more targeted than others. And my response to this question is that 
some minorities, some groups are being targeted simply because by virtue of their faith. So because of their faith, they became the main uh, target of mass violence. And it basically tells us something about the fragility of religious coexistence. So the book is primarily about two different religious minorities in the Middle East. The first one that I am going to talk a little bit today is Yazidis in Iraq. It's a very ancient religion, probably going back to the uh, 13th century. Uh, many people will say that there are no more than half million Yazidis left in the world. Many Yazidis will claim that we used to be many, but then many of us basically converted to Islam or being assimilated. And their homeland is northern Iraq. And the second group is the Alevis in Turkey, which probably makes around like 10 to 15 percent of the Turkish population nowadays. So I'm not going to talk about the Alevis, but then there's an extensive chapter on the Alevis in Turkey, which basically talks about different instances uh, where Alevis were targeted in Turkey in the late 20th century. So my main contribution or maybe conceptual contribution to the study of religion and politics is I come up with this term, uh, liminal minorities. So the term liman is actually a Latin term. I mean, if you look at the origins etymology of the term, it simply means threshold, in betweenness, ambiguity. And then many other scholars use it in different contexts. But I kind of really bring this term to the study of religion and politics. And my argument is that there are certain religious groups in the world whose religious beliefs are not defined. They remain ambivalent in the eyes of the dominant majority, and they lock theological recognition. So, for example, if you think about the Abrahamic religions, think about Judaism, Islam, Christianity, they always have a very complicated relationship. They have lots of hostilities, historically and contemporary. But at the same time, they really have a recognition of each other. So there is no real lack of the theological recognition. So when I talk about liminal minorities, I basically talk about groups which doesn't really have the theological recognition. So, for, for example, from the perspective of the Muslim orthodoxy, Yazidim is not a proper religion. I mean, sometimes they basically claim that it used to be some kind of a Islamic sect, but then, then they deviated from the right path. So they become like heretics. And others basically have all these kind of different ideas. But then in a sense, there's this kind of ambiguity characterizing the perception of the uh, Yazidis. And it's basically the same thing with the Alevis. But I also, in the book, I give different examples. Groups like Baha'is in Iran, Ahmadis in Indonesia, Pakistan. And it's not even very specific to Muslim world, but we can talk about... Yahoo witnesses in most of the Christian countries. And I also claim that the Mormons no longer it is the case, but back in, in the late 19th century and towards the mid 20th century, they were also liminal minority because they were not really recognized proper religion up until recently. Again, it's no longer the case, but then I think it was the case for a long time. So this is basically one definition of liminality. So they basically lack this theological recognition from the dominant religion. The second dimension is they also subject to lots of stigmas throughout the history. So they have been stigmatized by the members of the dominant religion. And to give you very specific examples, uh, for example, if we talk about the ESDs, uh, there are all these like chipolets about like this kind of widespread beliefs that Yazidis are devil worshippers. So from the Muslim perspectives, Yazidis actually worship the devil, which is obviously completely false. But then this kind of really comes from the fact that Many Muslims conflate the peacock angel, which is so central to the Yazid religion, with devil, which is obviously kind of one of the most hated figures in Islamic theology. Or there are all these kind of rumors that they engage in illicit sexual practices, they practice adultery. So that's kind of really, they're being demonized across the generations. And I, in the book, I kind of document that. And it's not only at the official level, but then you also basically see it at the more like uh, popular levels. So this is basically my kind of really contribution to this kind of the religion and politics saying that certain groups should be called liminal because they have this unique characteristics which set them apart from the rest of the religious groups. So then the motivating question for me in writing book is, uh, it goes back to 2017. Um, so I was organizing a conference in my previous institution and I hosted a couple of people who were actual members of the Yazidi community. So they show a documentary and documentary was about the, the Yazidis which were attacked by the South State Islamic State back in August, 2014 and how they basically organized this kind of rescue operation to save some of the people uh, back then. So I kind of was really uh, affected by that experience. And I basically end up uh, then traveling to Northern Iraq, to Iraqi Kurdistan several more times. I traveled to Germany. I basically talked to lots of different people. And I tried to basically understand the experience of these people, uh, what really happened to them back in 2014. So but this was basically really what motivated me. So the, the exceptional brutality they experienced at the hands of the uh, self-state Islamic State back in August 2014. 
And one thing I kind of realized that when we talk about Islamic State, we typically talk about the foreign fighters, which is true because there were tens of thousands of people from many countries, including the United States, which end up joining the Islamic State. But then when I look at the dynamics of violence against the SDs, I realized that it was most local people, their neighbors, who basically become their tormentors. And when I be say they become their tormentors, let me give you more uh, historical background. I can also show you this map because I think it will be useful for the audience. Uh, so the map basically shows you the, the kind of the corner of uh, the northwestern corner of Iraq, uh, then you have Syria and, and Turkey. So most of the Yazidis were living in an area called Sinjar. There's this kind of a small mountain called Sinjar Mountains. Um, and then most of the Yazidis were basically living uh, like around the mountain. So what happened back in August 2014 is that um, two months ago, IS captured Mosul. I think many, of, many people remember that the two divisions of the entire Iraqi army base evaporated. So they captured it. And then less than two months later, they target both Sinjar and Erbil. So this basically created a panic because uh, there's supposed to be some Kurdish forces who were supposed to protect Sinjar, but they fled. So the entire regime became completely defenseless. And then the IS people, many of them being actual locals, uh, they captured the Yazidi towns and villages without any difficulty. Uh, they executed around more than 1,500 people. Uh, and then they also captured more than 6,800 Yazidis, most of um, women and children. And they actually make them their, if I can use this word, they become their sexual slaves. And then the children become indoctrinated foot soldiers for the IS. Uh, around like, like tens of thousands of Yazidis took refuge on the Sinjar mountain. Uh, and then around like 15,000 of them were also killed because they were exposed to elements. There was not, not enough water. There was not enough food. So the only thing which basically survived them from a complete destruction is the uh, Obama administration's strikes, which basically helped the, the other Kurd, Kurdish forces from Syria to break the uh, siege, which was put by the IS. And that's basically how many people survived. But if you think about the scale of the violence, it was actually exceptional. Because, like, in a sense, one out of 50 Yazidis in the world were either killed or captured, and then half of the entire world population of the Yazidis become displaced. And the situation has not really improved uh, in the last 10 years. And obviously, August 2024 will be the anniversary of the, uh, like the, 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 the atrocities. Um, so, yeah, and so in a sense, this is basically what I try to make sense of what really kind of motivated the individuals, the local people, uh, to kind of attack the Yes, this. Um, so my argument is, uh, I kind of, and I was telling this Peter earlier before this talk. So there are like different ways to study this topic, like mass violence. Some people talk to perpetrators. You basically find people who commit terrible things and then sometimes they're imprisoned, sometimes they are remorseful. So sometimes they basically own their own crimes. And then you talk to them and then you basically try to get some insights about what really motivate them. In my case, this is not the situation because I was unable to talk to perpetrators for many different reasons, and I can explain why. So my strategy was basically talking to survivors uh, of that violence. Um, so most of the survivors, when I was doing this research back in 2018 and um, 17, were living in camps in Dohok area in Iraqi Kurdistan. So there were probably close to 200,000 Yazidis by that time, and the actual situation did not change dramatically since then. So I basically find lots of people and try to listen to their stories. And then I talk to other people who were involved in the Yazidi affairs, try to basically come up with a more comprehensive understanding of what really happened to them. Um, so this is basically how I kind of really try to come up with this narrative in the book uh, to kind of really explain what really happened in August 2014 and what really motivated local people to attack their neighbors. So my argument is twofold, and it's basically go back to some of the bigger debates I mentioned earlier. So I basically claim that the fact that the Yazidis were subject to stigmas, which were transmitted across generations, played a decisive role because they were always perceived as being devil worshippers. There were all these kind of false ideas about what the Yazidis were, what kind of practice they have. And this kind of really created this hostility among the local population against the Yazidis for many generations. And these ideas were not really challenged. Sometimes they were not expressed very explicitly, but every single Yazidi I talked to were aware that they were subject to all the stigmas, even after the violence, I mean, even since 2014. But then this doesn't really explain the time of, timing of the attacks because you can say that, well, okay, if these people were hated, but it really explains the fact that they were not really targeted 
up until uh, 2014. I mean, there were actually episodes of violence against Yazidis after the fall of Saddam in 2003. But then again, they were basically living there with their neighbors who ha happened to be Sunni Arabs and Turkabans for many generations. So my argument is that to be able to understand the timing of the attacks, we need to focus on the political situation. And my just kind of summarizes argument in a nutshell, what happened is that Yazidis were at the bottom of the hierarchy. They were despised for many generations across decades in Iraq. But after 2003, they were perceived to be making some gains. I mean, they did not become rich, they did not become powerful, but at the same time, their status in the Iraqi society became increased increase thanks to Kurdish patronage. So in a sense, they became part of this Kurdish attempts to control Northern Iraq, and this basically created lots of resentment among their neighbors, specifically the Sunni Arabs and the Sunni Turkmans, who did not like the fact that the Yazidis that, that they used to despise suddenly became more important in this geopolitical uh, circle. And this is just really the reason why they become targeted uh, after 2003. Uh, which is kind of interesting by that because, I mean, Yezis always tell the observers like me that they have been subject to lots of different violence for many centuries. They talk about the Ottoman era being very violent, but at the same time, they do not really talk about Saddam era being very violent. From their perspective, Saddam was a dictator, he was an authoritarian ruler, but the, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, he kind of really protected the Yazidis as long as they did not basically support the Kurdish uh, independence movement. So in a sense, their experience is so different than the Kurds because Kurds were subject to genocidal campaign by Saddam in the 80s. Um, so let me just say a couple of more words about like the implications. So when I think about the mass violence and how we kind of try to make sense of it, but more than that, how we can prevent that. So I will basically have two different perspectives. One is more optimistic and one is basically more pessimistic. Let me say the more optimistic perspective because, and this kind of really comes from like many different people thinking about how we can remember violence, what should I be forgetting? What should be basically commemorated? And the paradigm will be obviously Holocaust studies. So the basic idea is that you kind of really talk about the suffering of people, Jewish people, other people during the second world war under the Nazis. And the basic idea is that when people had this kind of reckoning with the past, they understand what happened and they will basically make a promise that these things will never happen, happen again. So, I mean, if you go to all these concentration camps in Europe or like different places, this is basically the message, this kind of didactic message you'll be getting. In a sense that what happened was terrible. And then once we basically became aware of that terrible things, then we will basically make sure that it's not going to happen again in the future. So this is a kind of very, very like a liberal understanding that, uh, by knowing what happened in the past, by recording with the past, then we basically condemn the past, but also take lessons and we are not going to repeat the same mistakes again. So this is maybe partially the experience of the Yazidis, one may say, because now if you think about the Yazidis, they are not having a very good time because they've all dispersed, many of them become refugees, but at the same time, they have this more like global recognition. I mean, most famous name will be obviously Nadia Murat from uh, 2018, who won the Nobel Peace Prize. She's a survivor herself. Uh, and then there are many other Yazidi women who survived, they become activists, and they kind of really promoted their community, their community's image in many different uh, international arenas. So there's more kind of a recognition of Yazidis as being a proper religion who suffer, and they kind of really epitomize this uh, religious minority that basically become the victims of unspeakable violence. But then I also have a more like a cynical perspective because my perspective is that even if people remember the violence, even they basically remember what happened in the past, it may not be sufficient as long as they feel lots of resentfulness uh, in contemporary times. And what I try to say is that, um, and it's kind of almost like sounds a bit ironic because when I talk about some other, of the other minorities I studied in the book, like Baha'is in Iran specifically. So as long as the state keep the minority under check, which basically means that as long as state doesn't really let the minority gain more power, more visibility, then, in a sense, it also prevents the ordinary people taking the mantle of natural law into their hands and attack the minority because they know that state basically kind of really subdues the minority. So in a sense, this is going to be a less peaceful situation as long as you keep the uh, hierarchies intact. And it's kind of a very cynical reading of maybe the uh, minority majority relations. But when I think about some of the, of the other cases, this is how I feel about that. Because again, like in a sense, as long as the minority is not making any demands, as long as they are being subdued, it doesn't really create resentment. And then even if they are being despised, the, the ordinary people, the majority is not going to really attack them because they think that they are being taken care of by the state. 
Uh, I mean, in the book, I kind of make some philosophical detours. Uh, like I basically refer to Walter Benjamin's famous article from 1920s to kind of really make my argument stronger. But this is basically one of the maybe cynical messages you can get from the book. I mean, in a sense, times of political change can be dangerous, specifically when the minorities make more demands because they create more resentfulness among the majority, which may then actually became more violent and more threatening. And I think we can actually make some comparisons with the, even with some of the Western countries nowadays about among this kind of a majoritarian uh, resentfulness. Um, so uh, let me just basically add a final note because I just want to keep my remarks to 20 minutes. Um, so also in the Middle East, it has been very controversial, the role of the United States, like under what conditions American interventions has been con constructive or complete disastrous. And I think many people will say that what happened in 2003, the invasion of Iraq was a disaster for many different reasons. But then sometimes when you look at the experience of the minorities, you get a much more complicated and nuanced picture. Because if nothing else, like the only reason why many Yazis survive, and we are talking about tens of thousands of people back in August 2014, that because there was a, uh, Obama administration decided to authorize airstrikes, which basically helped um, the local forces to really end the siege by the IS forces. And this is basically how they survived. I mean, when you always think about like the maybe grand American uh, ambitions in the Middle East in the last two decades, they have been complete, I think, failures to a certain extent. But again, from a minority perspective, sometimes this uh, interventions is basically the difference between life and death. And as long as you don't basically hear their voices, you don't really understand like how such kind of uh, like attacks or like strikes make make a big difference. Uh, so, and this is the reason maybe like many is this kind of really thought that the only reason or the only way they can survive in Iraq is some kind of international protection, which is actually not very politically feasible. But then when you talk to their experiences, you actually understand like how feel how vulnerable they felt. And then they only thought that, I mean, again, we survived because of the Western intervention, uh, which can be obviously very controversial when you think about the experience of other groups in the Middle East. Uh, so I mean, Peter, I just want to stop here because I think I hopefully I accomplished to kind of make uh, audience interest in the book more. Uh, but I will be happy to engage with your and audience questions at this point. Okay, and we have some audience questions coming in, and I'll get to those in a, in, in a minute. Um, and please use the Slido app to put your questions in for for Gunesh, uh, Murad, Tesco. Um, well, there was a lot to uh, take in there. Um, brilliant presentation. I guess on the question of the US invasion of Iraq, I would have a slightly different kind of take, which is, as you know well, there was no Al Qaeda presence in Iraq in 2003. It was one of the arguments for the war, the supposed presence, and Al Qaeda in Iraq became the most virulent Al, Al Qaeda affiliate, really uh, sparked the civil war in many ways by bombing uh, Shia uh, mosques and, and, and killing Shia religious figures. And then, of course, Al Qaeda in Iraq became ISIS. I mean, there were various different iterations. So yep. you can really draw a direct line between the US invasion and um, the creation of ISIS and then the attack on Sinjar. So, but I hear you that uh, obviously the Obama administration intervened. And I think it's important for listeners to remember because I think a lot of Americans might think that the Obama administration intervened in Iraq because of the murder of American journalist Jim Foley by ISIS, which got a huge amount of attention. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Obama administration in, in, intervened in Iraq before that yep. on, on the very specific question of genocide, which for the United States, as I understand it, you tell me if I'm wrong, a, genocide, a, a finding of genocide would trigger a necessary response from the United States. Obviously, it have, or hasn't always happened, the Tutsis and the Hutus, etc. But in this case, it did, and it saved a lot of people's lives. It did, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this idea about liminal minorities is, is a very rich one, because as I understand it, well, first of all, I was really surprised by something in your book, which you describe now, which is the role that local people played in, you know, attacking and killing the Yazidis. And I yeah, you know, I just always thought it was ISIS. I had no idea that it was neighbors in a sense, like some of the Poles who intervened during the Holocaust against the Jews, who just were neighbors who, you mm -hmm. know, actively attacked the Jews at the same time that the Nazis were. So were you, did you kind of going into this, did you know this or is this just something that you found out as you reported? Yeah. And I just want to say something about this invasion of Iraq, which is also like for the Yazidis, it's also like a, like is a curse too, because if you think about that, 
after 2003, the Iraq became a complete unsafe place for the Yazidis because all this Al Qaeda and obviously later uh, Islamic State of Iraq became fascist anti Yazidi, like on theological reasons, because they were claiming that they were devil worshippers, they were heretics, and they need to be either eradicated or enslaved. So, in a sense, yes, American invasion helped them in 2014, but the reason why they end up being subject to all this violence is because of what happened in 2003. So, there's always this kind of irony from the Yazidi perspective. Uh, Regarding your question, second question, Peter, no, I didn't know about that. But then anybody who is studying this topic become really surprised because there's all consistency in all these responses saying that the people who attack us in most cases were actually people we knew, even sometimes by name, not even by mm -hmm. face. Because there are all these examples that, uh, for example, you have a neighbor, you invite him to a circumcision ceremony. And the idea is that the man keeps the boy on his lap and the boys basically blood spill on his cloth. And it's basically kind of old tradition of making, uh, establishing trust between two communities. But then guess what? Then when the time comes on August 3rd, 2014, the people who used to hold the baby or the boys in their laps come to the villages and took away the woman. And then they already knew each other from this like former ceremonies. And what you feel is that this kind of deep sense of betrayal in the sense that these are the people we knew for many generations. But then again, when the time comes, when they basically find the opportunity, they attack us. So this is basically really very consistent in every single here's a testimony we hear. Uh, I haven't, had, yeah. So this basically, I mean, yes, but it's very surprising by stuff. But you don't know it until you basically talk to these days. I, I had no idea. It was uh, very, very interesting. So let me ask you about the whole question of liminal minorities, because you also talk about the Ahmadis and Pakistan, mm -hmm. yeah. others, and you mentioned the Jehovah's Witnesses and in years past the Mormons, which is obviously but there was a lot of suspicion of Mormonism until more recently. You know. So is part of the issue that these sects um, tend to be pretty secretive about what their beliefs are? Is that part of the issue? Yes, and then, but then there's a reason why they are secretive, because if they become too, kind of, if they become too exposed to the outside society, then they also become much more vulnerable. I mean, yes, they are secretive, and then just because they are secretive, it creates lots of rumors misconceptions, false ideas about what they do. I mean, one typical thing you see, not even only about these groups in Muslim societies, but you can even think about like 16th century France, about some Huguenots, the former Protestants, that whenever they have rituals, religious rituals, they engage actually in sexual orgies. And this is completely wrong perception, obviously. But then it's kind of really interesting, sometimes fascinating to see how these kind of rumors and these kind of misconceptions are really so consistent across uh, different cultures but yes yeah. because of secrecy it kind of fosters that kind of like perception but and, and what you're saying which makes a lot of sense they have a good reason to be secret if they advertise their beliefs in the kind of um, <laughs> they would be regarded as heretical that's very much true yeah yeah so let me ask you about the alawites in syria because they seem to have some similar i know you don't cover it in the book and obviously assad is an alawite and it's a minority in syria mm -hmm. with um i would say their views are widely regarded. I'm not a Muslim, I think you are, but I think you know, Al Alawism is A, regarded as heretical by most, even Shia, I think, and it also has this sort of secretive element to it. Yes. Yep. But but in a way, the situation's reversed because Assad is in power and he, you know, but mm -hmm. so have the Alawites in Syria been attacked in the same way, you know, historically, maybe during the Ottoman Empire or later. Yeah, I mean, in the Ottoman Empire, you have all this, like, especially in the late Ottoman era, like in the late 19th century, you have these faith campaigns. The basic idea is that we have all these groups, Alevis, Alevis, but you can also talk about Durzis in Lebanon, definitely is mm -hmm. in Iraq. And all they become, all became subject of these campaigns and not only try to kill them, but basically try to make them proper Muslims. Because from the Ottoman perspective, they were actually ignorant people living in very remote areas. And then they don't know what proper Islam is. They don't really have a proper religion. So we are basically going to send our pashas, but also some clerics, and try to basically estimate them to the Sunni Islamic perspective. And yes, I'm definitely, the Alevites were subject to that kind of campaigns. But the only reason they kind of became really dominant was because of the obvious Hafez Assad back in 1970. He captured power in Syria. And then compared to previous dictators, he was probably much smarter. Mm -hmm. And he managed to stay in power. Uh, and then, I mean, yeah. I mean, but also, if you're Alevites, basically see what happened to other minorities and probably that makes you even much more reluctant to share power with the Sunni majority because you think that if you do that 
then you, use your, you are going to lose your leverage and it's going to have disaster consequences for your uh, mere existence. And of course, ISIS really came, ISIS became ISIS uh, in the fight against Assad, who they regarded his regime as heretical. And if you go back in time, you know, Al-Qaeda in Iraq was pretty much defeated in 2011. And they crossed the border into Syria mm -hmm. to get involved in the civil yep, war, exactly. started fighting ISIS, started fighting the Assad regime. And then crossed back into Iraq in 2013, 2014, and as you say, took Mosul and mm -hmm. and, and and all the other places that they took. So, um, but yeah, so you understand why there is um, the Alawites. For them, this war is existential. It seems right because they're. It is yes, it is yeah, and it's kind of ironic because sometimes when you look at the religious minorities, you may think that they why they support authoritarian rulers. I mean, you can say it's some other religious minorities, but I mean, there's a reason for that because they think that. Democratization can be very dangerous because with democratization, mm -hmm. you basically open the Pandora's box and then your reference point will be always what happened in Iraq, what happened in Syria. And then you became even more like a strong supporter of the authoritarian regime. So it's kind of really ironic in that sense. Yeah. You mentioned the Druze in Lebanon who also have a, a sort of pretty closed, secretive yeah. kind of set of religious beliefs, obviously in a predominantly um, Muslim and sort of Christian environment. Um, yes. Yep. But so you, but you selected as, uh, so, I mean, you obviously had to make some choices about what you wanted to, to cover and you, you said selected the, the, um, the Yazidis and the Alevis and the Bahia and the Ahmadis and the Ahmadis are of course in Pakistan mostly. Mm -hmm. um, so what was the process for you to sort of select these? And I'm going to ask an audience question that's related, which is mm -hmm. from Barbara. What methods did you use to analyze the data that you collected? Did you quantify the points? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, I think I explained why I basically end up studying is this because I was actually motivated by that experience, which is obviously very yeah. current. And then regarding Barbara's question, I mean, what you do is that, I mean, I did lots of work as a scholar talking to lots of different people in the last 15 years or so. And then you always basically look for consistent patterns in the sense that you try to understand whatever people tell you actually is verified by other interlocutors, by other interviews. But also, it doesn't mean that you always take them at the face value because if it is to say that you were attacked by the Muslims because they hate us, I actually question that because then I ask, okay, but then they didn't actually attack you before that. So you basically kind of engage in this kind of a really questioning and then try to triangulate different sources to be able to come up with a more com comprehensive response. Because then I mean, I mean, this is not telling me that uh, the Sunni Muslims were resentful, and this is the reason they attack us. This is basically my own argument based on my reading of different sources of evidence. Uh, Alevi is in Turkey. I, I was born in Turkey, so I basically have some childhood memories of some of the violence happening in that country against this group. And it's basically almost like sometimes when you become a scholar and then you have the luxury of writing about topics you want to write, then you go back to some of your observations from the earlier ages and try to basically make sense of them. And this is the reason why I basically end up writing about the, the Alevis. And maybe one advantage is that there were lots of court documents I was able to uh, analyze. I mean, in the in the case of Yazidis, I did not have access to court documents. But then in the case of the Alevi massacres in Turkey, many people were taken to court. There were all these like different sources of information. And I had a better understanding of who were the actual local people who attacked the Alevis. It's not necessarily the case in the uh, Yazidis because I know some of the people by name. But others are kind of enigma to me. I mean, I only know that there were local people attack, but it also become difficult to just name them uh, because of complete, because of uh, lack of information. And well. why are the Alevis in, in Turkey regarded sort of as a, as a legitimate target for some Muslims to attack? What what is what, what set of beliefs do they have that are... I mean, there. I mean, it's always that kind of a, I would say, shibboleths in a sense, like, if you are living in a local society, if you are Muslim, you go to a mosque, you pray five times a day. At least, I mean, you, this basic expectation. You fast. If you have the means, you go to Hajj. If you are Alevi, you are not doing any of these things. So in a sense, they are basically different because they are not doing the things which are supposed to be done by the local Sunni Muslims. And this has been the case across generations. I mean, with the modern Turkey, many of these people became more social mobile. They come to cities, they become educated, and over time, this also creates lots of resentment because it's always basically the if you think from this perspective, it's kind of almost like universal experience in many different societies. If you feel that some of the groups which used to be despised, that they occupied the bottom of the hierarchy, and then suddenly you see them being more visible, this typically creates resentfulness. It doesn't mean that it always creates potential violence, but it can be actually a very dangerous dynamic in that sense because 
it basically means there's a change in hierarchy and then people typically don't like that kind of changes, not definitely in their lifetime and not definitely if they became the losers of that kind of change. And this was the case also in the with the Alevis in Turkey back in 1970s and early 1990s. It's no longer the case because we have a Islamic government for the last 22 years, but it is a different and, like a situation. Yeah. But, and why, how did the Erdogan government change things? I mean, because Erdogan government is a very Sunni government and they don't give many opportunities to the Alevis, which basically means the Alevis remain more marginalized. But then if they are being more marginalized, they don't create much tensions <laughs> in the sense that they are not basically creating a lot of resentfulness among the Sunni majority. It's kind of, again, it basically goes back to my earlier point. But this is the reason why you don't have any Alevi massacres in Turkey in the last two decades. Um, Another because, group, yeah. as you're talking, that sort of fits in this category, I think, are the Ismailis, who are, of course, throughout yes. South Asia and some of them yeah. are... In, yep. in Africa, and they've been very successful. But I mean, if, if you if you're an Ismaili in the Muslim world, you kind of tend to keep that to yourself, even today, right? Yes, I, I agree. And some of these groups have been more successful because they have more resourcefulness. Sometimes they establish very effective diasporas, and diasporas really affect the world public opinion. I think Ismail is a case like that. Um, so the liminality is not really a fate in a sense because it may change, it may be transformed. So groups may get more recognition, and maybe one only good thing out of the genocidal campaign against the Yazidis is that now they are recognized as a more proper religion than ever. So it's kind of really a much more dynamic uh, situation as a result of that. Uh, this relates to what you just said. This is a comment from Anonymous. Mm -hmm. Despite being targeted for so many years, how have the Yazidis managed to survive and maintain their existence as a community in Iraq? It's a very indigenous community, which basically means that they only marry with each other, but even so, there are all these different castes, like classes within the Yazidis. So if you are a certain class, you are not supposed to marry with each other. You are only supposed to marry with each other from the people from the same class. So they basically keep it to themselves because I mean, it's a, yeah, it's a very relevant question because typically, if your woman and girls end up marrying with non Yazidis, over time your numbers are going to decline. So the only way they can actually keep their society intact is basically keeping marriage within the community. But then if you are being displaced and many of the people became uh, refugees, it also creates more problems for the community in the long run because it also makes it much more difficult for these, the community to remain as a intact community in the, in, in, across maybe a couple of generations. But this is how they survive basically because they kind of really kept it that, that themselves. Sinjar was an isolated area. Um, and as a result, yeah, they basically kind of really tried to prevent any kind of marriages with the non the groups. This was basically their survival strategy. You mentioned Nadia Murad, who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2018. Yeah. You know, what is the state? Of, and I think she's represented by Amal Clooney, I think is her lawyer. That's correct. Right? Yes. Yeah, that's correct. Um, so she's been represented in what way? Um, is there a kind of claim at the ICC or somewhere uh, of genocide with particular perpetrators who are named? Or what is the status of these legal cases if they, if they exist? I mean, so there are all these like transitional justice attempts in Iraq. So there are basically attempts to basically document uh, um, survivor testimonies. And this has been done by some courts in Iraq. There used to be this kind of a, I forgot the specific name, but there's a United Nations like specific uh, agency, which basically focuses on the crimes by Daesh. This is obviously the Arabic name for the Islamic State. But the problem is that given the situation in Iraq, there is no really like a functional court system. I mean, in a sense, sometimes you talk this and you get the impression that people who attack them now switch sides and they basically joined the Shiite dominant government in Iraq. So then it also means that Yazidis became completely disillusioned. Uh, it's just more like a symbolic justice more than anything else because I mean, when it comes to really reconciliation or really just try to punish the perpetrators, I think this is just very complicated simply because Iraq is another country that you can't talk about the post anything. It's basically a very like unstable place uh, for the obvious reasons. But the only thing again, like you can talk more maybe in a substantial manner is attempts by the Yazidis to get more symbolic justice. So they basically erected this genocide monument in Sinjar uh, just basically five, six months ago. Uh, again, like the Nadim Murad, but there are many other women who basically get different kind of prizes. They basically were invited to speak in different forums. So there's a kind of understanding that they really suffered a lot and they basically deserve dignity and recognition. But this is a more symbolic level because it doesn't help them. So it's not like Germany is basically giving or France is giving them more than asylum just because they saw a lot because they they said that now you live in Iraq and you live in a camp which is okay because you are not being threatened physically so we can't give you uh, asylum so um, and maybe another uh, but yeah go on please, Peter please. is that I mean so the Yazidis are not getting asylum in most western they countries did, they did 
immediately after the there are some special quota programs special in germany so germany basically gave access to maybe 1100 women who were most survivors and they were taken to stuttgart area back in i think 2016 and 17. but then again it has been 10 years and many of this live in the camps i visit the camps a couple of times many other people go there you go there and then you think that well these people may actually continue to live there for the next how many years yeah because from the asylum perspective they are no longer being physical threatened right but then again it means nothing about their like circumstances because the circumstances still basically remain terrible so yeah i mean I, people sometimes basically think okay if the yeses are being recognized it's a good thing i mean yes but then again it doesn't mean anything for the physical conditions of the community uh which basically remain very dire so you mentioned that you did not speak to the perpetrators and you, you um was that for ideological reasons or practical reasons or both practical reasons i mean you know i don't speak arabic so it's always difficult to speak to people to the translators some people were captured that they were in prison but then it also crashed some ethical issues and i'm well i talk to lots of different people in my life maybe not as much as you did with different like personalities but then sometimes it requires lots of rapport and trust to be able to get anything meaningful from a conversation but it also means that you need to talk to people over an extended period of time. If you go and then talk to a person for an hour, two hours, it's difficult to get anything meaningful up. So it's not an ideological reason, it's just basically very practical, logistical reasons uh, more than anything else. Uh, yeah, I mean, the ethical reasons are, I presume that if you were to talk to ISIS members who are in jail in Iraq or, um, you know, they're, I mean, they're in prison, right? And so, and also yes. the, yeah, yeah. sort of- and Not the most ethical Yeah. 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 Um, and let me just turn to another audience question. How does mass violence against liminal groups differ from mass sectarian violence against larger, more established groups? For example, Sunni targeting or Shia and vice versa. I mean, what's so? Yeah. Yeah, it's a very good question. I appreciate it. I'll talk about that because, yes. I mean, the motivation typically is different because let's say you can make the argument that when the Sunnis and Shias had the civil war situation, as you were mentioning, Peter, earlier, I mean, it's not that people look at each other's fates and they say, okay, they don't believe Ali, the son in law of Prophet Muhammad, was doing this or that. It's just more about the power struggle, in a sense, who's going to really capture the state, who's going to get access to more resources. It's just a much more political dynamic there. But if you think about the limited minorities, like is this, they were basically very weak. They were very fragmented. So they were not being big threat. They were not really rich. So it's not like you basically kill Yezis and capture their properties either. So there were basically more kind of pure religious reasons which became much more clear here. Because I think sometimes people conflate that, okay, if there's a Sunnis and Shiites, they fight against each other for the last 1,400 years. I mean, obviously it doesn't make sense because it's, not, it's just much more complicated than that. But because also there's a much more political reasons why Sunnis and Shiites had all these like fights in the Middle East uh, in the last two decades. But again, when you come to use this, unless you basically focus on the why they were become subject of stigmas, it is very difficult to make sense of why they're being targeted. I mean, again, because they were not chattering, they were not basically greedy, they did not become very powerful. So you can actually keep them under control and you don't have to basically kill them or basically take them and enslave, enslave them, unless you think that there are people who do not deserve any kind of protection because of their religious faith and which was being despised across the generations. So this is basically my main argument in the book in that sense. So there's a difference definitely from my perspective. Well, here's an interesting one. So the Houthis in Yemen are basically have won the war in yes. the sense that they have controlled the north, which is where all the population is. They control Sana, the capital, and they also control the main port. And I, Houthis may actually be an example of a liminal minority to some degree, I think, because they have mm -hmm. certainly their Shia, their Shiism is not at all mainstream. No. And yet they're an example of a mon liminal minority, which actually has done pretty well for a variety of reasons, including a lot of support from Iran. Mm -hmm. So how does this fit into this framework? So it fits in the framework in the sense that like maybe the big the big difference is basically the compared to Yazdis, Alevis, but also Baha'is in Iran or Ahmadis in like Pakistan, as we talked earlier, the Hutus became much more powerful and successful, but they're also much more organized. I mean, there were not a single Yazdi militia before 2014. They were completely at the mercy of the other groups. But then again, like if you think of the Hutus, they really challenged the central government in Sana and they become successful. And as you just mentioned earlier, they took over most of the country. I think this is the biggest difference in the sense that they were much more organized. And I think they have also bigger in numbers. They were also geographically concentrated, which give them an advantage with their opponents. 
When right. I think about the Baha'is, for example, I mean, they are probably the most political quietest group in Iran, but it doesn't really help them because they basically suffer a lot under the current Islamic Republic. And what about the Ahmadis in Pakistan? I mean, what is their sort of position in society? I, I mean, uh, and, I, and it relates to the previous question, which is, you know, Christians in pa Pakistan are really, uh, particularly recently, it's become, I think, worse and worse. They're only 2% of the population. They are, um, I think, highly discriminated against. And um, so, you know, uh, but, you know, they're not necessarily physically attacked all the time or anything like that, but they're, they're definitely at the bottom of the totem pole. What so? What are the Ahmadis and their beliefs that and and what makes them a liminal minority in Pakistan? So Ahmed is a very interesting case. I kind of have one chapter where I talk about the Baha'is and Ahmadis together. So Ahmed is it emerged in the late nineteenth century. So Ghulam Ahmed, uh, he was actually it's kind of lots of controversy, but then he was perceived as being a prophet. But then obviously from the Sunni Orthodox perspective, it is completely unacceptable because you can have prophets after Prophet Muhammad himself. So. Ironically, Ahmadis claim they are Muslims, but they are not being accepted as Muslims by the other Sunni groups, which is very different than Yazidis because Yazidis are not telling you that we are Muslims. They say that we are a different religion, while the other people say that, no, you are not a religion, you are basically some kind of heretical sect. And the Ahmadis were actually kind of really subject to lots of discrimination in Pakistan, but they are most legal discrimination. So there's actually conscious amendments back in the 1970s, which basically make it impossible for the Ahmadis to claim the status of being Muslim. And this also kind of related lots of difficulties for the entire community. So what I did basically say is that they are under really all this repressive apparatus, which is very legal. It also means that in an ironic way, it kind of limits the amount of physical violence they experience because they are being subdued by the state itself, unlike other cases. Um, but yeah, they are definitely a classical example of a liminal minority from my perspective. And not only in, 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 in Pakistan, but there's also a large community in Indonesia and I'm not an expert on the, the, the part of the, region, uh, the world, but I know that as a fact, there has been actually more discrimination against the Ahmadis even in, in Indonesia in the last couple of decades. But they're really kind of more like a legally second-class citizen in both countries at the moment. You mentioned at the beginning Christopher Browning's book, Ordinary Men, which I'm going to try and summarize the argument for of, um, you know, came out in 1999. It's probably one of the most significant yep. books about the Holocaust. And he focused on a single battalion of German soldiers who you know killed a lot of Jews in Poland? They didn't. Most of them didn't really particularly want to do it. They didn't. It seemed that they just did it out of peer pressure. So, um, and I don't think I think, I mean, as far as I can tell, you tell me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, Browning, I mean, he, his book is one of the sort of most important books in that have been written about the Holocaust. I don't think anybody's yeah, I agree. wrong. Yeah. So. You know, in the context of going back to the Yazidis and these ordinary neighbors who attacked them, I and mean, what did you, you read Christopher Browning perhaps before you did this research, or how did, how did it, how did, and how does it fit into what happened with the Yazidis? Yeah, I mean, this is actually a very important lineage of that kind of argument. I mean, people think of Milgram's famous experiments, but then Zimbardo at Stanford Prison Experiment, you think about Arendt's, like the study of Eichmann. Hmm. So the basic idea is that. If you put the people under very different circumstances, you can really get the worst out of them. I mean, if I may to kind of summarize it, then maybe kind of a very simplistic way. I think it's a, it has very strong insight because it basically means that none of us may be immune to that kind of behavior. But at the same time, there's a missing piece from my perspective, and it's basically what I claim in the book. It doesn't really explain why certain individuals or certain groups are being targeted more than others. Because mm -hmm. then if you don't basically think about people's like predispositions, their fate, sometimes it can be about ethnicity, sometimes it can be about the race. It doesn't tell you why Yazidis but not another group were subject to this exceptional brutality. This is basically my criticism of that kind of perspective. Because I mean, then why the Jews, but not the other groups in Nazi Germany? Because there were many other minorities in like different parts of the, like, the East Europe and also in Germany. But if you think about like the United States, like you think about like the uh, Jim Crow segregation era, like there were lots of African Americans who were being lynched, but not necessarily other groups. So I mean, that because then how are you going to make sense of it unless you basically think about racism as a factor in motivating people's behavior during that time? So my argument is that unless you basically look at the predisposition of people, why certain groups are being subject to stigmas, hatred, then it's hard to understand. Yeah, yes, maybe. <laughs> All of us can be monsters under certain circumstances, unfortunately, 
but then maybe we'll be more monsters towards some other some groups more than others. This is basically how I try to kind of really address this uh, very yeah. important question. So yeah, well, that is a very important question. But going back to this question of uh, you know ordinary people doing really horrible things, and you know the, it's sort of like a big ethical question, which is you know. I think all of us have to consider, which is, um, you know, would we be a capo in a concentration camp if uh, that was the way we could survive? And, and um, you know, nobody knows until the situation comes, right? It's not like some people, we will be heroes and they'll join the Red Orchestra and, you know, fight against the Nazis, you know, at, at a certain cost of their lives yep. with no chance of success. And others will, you know, become informants or and you don't really know until the moment comes. And so what you what you what you seem to be saying also is the moment came in August of 2014. Uh, all of these people who had, had a good relations with the Yazidis mm -hmm. turned into monsters. But the reason they were monsters was they thought the Yazidis were perf really outside any kind of normal religious yeah. And that outside it... of any pale of religious acceptance, this is, I think the word exact word I'm using yeah. in the exact phrase I'm using in the book. Yes, because it, I mean it may be surprising to some of our audience, but then IS treatment of the Christians were actually milder compared to this. So I mean, then... I mean, the IS treatment of the Christians in Mosul in that area yeah. in the United Plains. Where, I mean, it was still terrible, but that it's basically still milder compared to these. This I mean, the only group which was yeah. enslaved in mass was basically is this, which is interesting by itself because again, because it is much more easy to justify all this exceptional brutality and atrocities against this group than another group. With Christians, I mean, they were given options. I mean, yes, they were basically being robbed. They were basically being asked to leave. But then again, you can't talk about like thousands of Christian women being enslaved by the IS, which may be interesting by itself because again, like, I mean, IS is always not a friend of the <laughs> uh, other religions. But then again, it became easier for them to justify violence against the Yazis because they were devil worshippers, they were heretics, and then they had no right for existence in this world. So in the case of the Christians in Mosul, the ISIS didn't, they may have, I mean, was that because in the, um, because there is a doctrine about Christians in the, in, uh, yep. you know, if they pay the tax and they kind of, you know. Jizya tax, yeah, Jizya and the Middle system coming from Ottomans, yes, I mean, if you're a religious minority, which is properly recognized by the Islamic theology, I mean, yes, you are not a full citizen, but then again, you still basically enjoy certain kind of protections. And I ask kind of really practice it. It doesn't mean that the Christians want to live under IS rule, but at least they have the option of, in most cases, they have the option of living and escaping the safety of Iraqi Kurdistan. Are you concerned about, I, you say IS, I say ISIS, you could say the Islamic State or the Daesh, or there's a lot of different ways to put it, but let's say ISIS or Islamic mm -hmm. State. Mm -hmm. Are you concerned that um, they might come back? And I, I'll, I'll ask uh, two or three sort of sub-questions. One, you obviously have these giant refugee camps like the yeah. whole camp, oh, yeah. which are sort of a, incubating a new generation of ISIS um, kids. Um, two, you know, there is a real discussion right now between the Iraqis and the U.S. about pulling all U.S. troops out of yeah. Iraq. And even though there are only 2,500, I think yeah. they, they play an important psychological role. Mm -hmm. um, because, I mean, the last time we went you know, it was Vice President Biden and Tony Blinken, his national security advisor in 2011, who pulled U.S. troops out of Iraq. Three years later, ISIS is marching close to Baghdad, mm -hmm. took over much of the country, including Mosul, the second biggest city. So, you know, the ideology is sort of out there. We saw an ISIS-K attack in Moscow that killed 143 people just very recently. Um, uh, you know, so what do you think uh, on the question of ISIS surviving you know what would happen if the u.s pulled out of iraq obviously the iranian influenced politicians and military leaders in iraq want that to happen but there are plenty of iraqis who sort of don't want that to happen and my guess is it will just get keep getting pushed and we'll have a committee to investigate this and, and like no decision will be made and everybody will wait for if trump gets elected in november 2024 and that might change things but so what do you think is the future of isis in the region and how it affects Yazidis and other uh, and other groups. I mean, it's a very unstable situation, Peter, because and you talk about a whole camp, which is probably fifty thousand people, mostly IS former supporters, and Anand Gopal, who writes for New Yorker, he's also one of our affiliates at ASU. He wrote a very, I think, interesting article for New Yorker, I think, a couple of months ago yeah. about a whole camp. And when you read the article like that, you basically get the impressions like a tinderbox, because yeah. and you can make sense of it because there's no political resolution. If you think about all the Sunni communities in northern Syria and Iraq, that probably feel very disfranchised. There is no real basically any like a prospects for anything 
positive. They don't have the opportunity because, yes, as you just mentioned, there is still the American forces, the Kurdish forces, the Shiite forces basically have the upper hand. But at the same time, it's a completely frozen conflict. And as long as there's this huge resentment, and as long as you have this like a young population with no real hope for the future, I mean, it's very hard to predict the timing of what may happen. But then because obviously people's attention switched to Israel, Palestine, Ukraine, other conflicts, but nothing is resolved in that part of the world either. Uh, it just basically remains very unstable. And I think there's a great potential for uh, violence. It's obviously very hard to know what may happen because I also yeah. agree with the ideology is there. It's not like completely discredited because I mean, yeah, like I mean, <laughs> it's not that there has been a kind of a religious reformation, reformation in the sense that the IS ideology was completely disbanded. No, I mean, it's basically still there. And it may appeal to lots of people because they have nothing to lose at, 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 at that point. Yeah, and I think one of the biggest changes since 9-11 in the, in the region, tell me if I'm wrong, is, you know, anti-Shiism, I mean, it's been around for a long time, but, you know, this kind of, you know, Al-Qaeda didn't really practice this yeah. sort of radical, you know, militant anti-Shiism. And uh, I think that may be here to stay. Mm -hmm. I think, yes. Right. Because if, obviously, especially with Iran, I mean, Iran's geopolitical ambitions obviously make the Shias, like most of the Shiite groups are being supported by the Iran, which is obviously a kind of threat to the most of the Sunni states in the region. And this is obviously kind of much broader geopolitical rivalry, which basically yeah. also affects this kind of local dynamics for sure. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. However, I mean, except that no Sunni majority country is in favor of ISIS because, <laughs> for, you know, they're not getting support from the from yeah. Sunni majority uh, countries. Let me ask you a, a final question coming from the audience yeah. from Barbara. Um, is the violence because the Yazidis grew out of Islam rather than coming from accepted people of the book or Ottoman uh, millet? I mean, yes, but then even the origins of Yazidis being very controversial, and even the Yazidis sometimes basically give different responses. Like, for example, some of them will say that, well, we actually go back to Zoroastrianism. Maybe we are one of the most ancient religions. We actually precede Islam, but others may say that, well, Sheikh Aidi, who is the most important figure in Yazidism, he used to be a Sufi Sheikh, which basically means that maybe they come out of Islam. But even the origins of the religion has been really a source of different controversy. But the point is right in the sense that because of that, they were never recognized as one of the members of the millet system, even on the Ottomans. And they basically make them really exposed to uh, much more violence and much more kind of discrimination as a result of that. And this, unfortunately, obviously, came back after 2003 with the fall of the Saddam era uh, in Iraq. The book is Liminal Minorities. Congratulations, Gunesh, on the book. And if you want to buy it, uh, there's a, a place you can buy it on your screen. Uh, thank you very much for talking with us. And thank you to the audience for tuning in. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you.